This program is brought to you by Emory University. All right, so we're going to be covering the uh, remedial plants for the GI tract. We're going to be talking about diarrhea, constipation, gastritis, flatulence, and irritable bowel, <laughs> and uh, going over some of the different compounds isolated from, um, from these. and their effects and mechanisms of action. So this is a, a more extensive list, again, because we are covering multiple plants. Um, again, for diarrhea, some of the, the best types of therapies come from just heavy starch um, <coughs> consumption, in, especially when it's incorporated into oral rehydration therapy. So these would be um, examples of, of important genera would include Oriza, Zea, and Solanum. Now, I forget, what does Oriza stand for? Which um, plant? Isn't it rice? Rice. Which family? Poaceae. It's a grass. It's a grass. Okay. Poaceae. Very good. How about Zea? I'll even give you a species, Zaya maize. Corn. Which family? Poaceae. It's a grass. Good. How about Solanum? Potato. Which family? Solanaceae. You guys are getting it. Good. All right. And then astringents come from many different species. One thing in common we find with many of these species is that they are rich in tannins. How do tannins behave on a membrane? What were tannins used for in the past um, in kind of crafts? Tanning leather, right? So what do they do when they encounter a membrane? What kind of activity? They're stringents, right? They are stringents. They also bind with what in the gut? This is what makes them such good antimicrobials. They bind with proteins, right? And so can you, you can actually lead to diseases um, in protein deficiency if you have too many tannins in the diet because it will bind up the available proteins and lead to protein deficiency. Um, but they can be very useful in treating diarrhea um, in, in, in small doses. Now, the laxative drugs, there are two different major groups of laxatives we're going to go over, and I'm going to break those down into groups. But um, these are some of the most important ones. You have your bulk form, your bulk forming laxatives. It's just what it sounds like. It basically, they work by absorbing water, forming bulk in the gut that basically puts pressure and helps move things along. Again, remember, the gut is just a long system of tubes that's twisted. So it expands and helps things go through. So some examples would include linum, who's a Lucetatissimum, which is a horrible species name, um, which is linseed. Um, you have Triticum estivum in the grass family. What does that stand for? What's the common name? We already covered it. Wheat. That's wheat. Okay. <coughs> um, you have uh, other uh, stimulant laxatives would include Cassia cinna and Cassia angustifolia. That's those cinnapods. That I showed you here. We'll pass these around so you can take a better look at them. And then other ones include aloe vera. Again, drinking that um, aloe vera juice can act as a laxative, as a stimulant laxative. And then rhamnus species. Whenever I have um, the, the SPP that's referring to multiple species within this genus that have these active compounds. <clears throat> For gastritis and ulcers, these are some commonly used um, medicinals. Matricaria recutita, which family is that one in? I forgot to write it up there. You guys need to know it, though. First, what is the common name of that plant? I believe we've covered it in class. Asteraceae. It's Asteraceae family. Good. It's in the daisy family. What is it? Chamomile. chamomile. Yes, good. So you have chamomile in the Asteraceae family. How about Glycerinthia glabra? What else do you have when you have an upset tummy? You might have some chamomile tea or some what other kind of tea? Mint. It's not a mint. That's minta is, is the genus for mint. That is another one you might have for an upset tummy. This is licorice. Licorice, okay? Glycerinsia glabra. Anyone want to take a stab at the family? 
I'll give you a clue. It's a bean. Bevy C. Good, good, good. Okay, and then we have for heartburn and dyspepsia, you have Cynera <coughs> scolimus, and also in the Asteraceae family. This is um, uh, uh, looks in, in some ways similar to Syllabum marianum, but a little bit of a smaller looking plant. So it's, it looks similar to milk thistle in some ways, but it's different, different genus. And then we have Gentiana lutea, or a gentian, yellow gentian. I brought this back from the Balkans. And this has an incredibly distinctive taste. If you um, dip your tongue to this, I thought about chopping it up and having to ruin taste, and well, maybe that's not the best idea. But <laughs> if you are really dying to taste yellow gentian, you can just take a little piece and t tip it, touch it to the tip of your tongue. It's intensely bitter, intensely bitter um, because of the compounds in it. So those are some things for heartburn. And then for nausea and vomiting, actually there are some plants in there that you might not expect to be medicinals, but that can be quite useful. So Datura is of course a hallucinogen, but also is a source of some compounds that are useful in treating nausea and vomiting, um, scopolamine in particular. You have um, Hyosimus niger, also a very poisonous plant, but also has some medicinal potential in this context. And then Zinderbrophicinale, what is that plant? Ginger. Ginger, and the Zingiberaceae. And then lastly, for irritable bowel syn syndrome, bloating and flatulence, we have um, some of the ones that you're probably quite familiar with, including multiple types of mints in the, mintha in the mintha genus, Lamiaceae family, um, carum carvi, also um, in the carrot family, or Apiaceae, and then funiculum vulgare, or fennel, in the Apiaceae. And we'll go through each of these in detail. Now, who cares about diarrhea? You should all care about diarrhea because it actually globally kills about 5 million people a year for multiple causations, um, different types of parasites or different types of parasites or other um, pathogens. I'm actually on tape saying, <coughs> my, I think, you're, I think my, there was a, I have a video online um, saying how much I like the study of diarrhea. It's not one of my best moments. <laughs> But diarrhea is important. <laughs> so, um, and in fact, there are 2.5 million children each year that are actually impacted by this. So these are little kids under the age of five that can be, again, their, their water balance can be completely um, just put into imbalance and, and lead to death um, in young children. So <coughs> some of the primary forms of treatment, again, are these oral rehydration therapies um, coming from different sources of starches. Rice, in particular, can be a very good um, uh, plant to use in treating this, also because of its cost effectiveness. Rice is quite cheap and widely available in many countries. And it works, um, in addition to adding starch to the, to the gut, you have the, the, um, the polysaccharides in rice are hydrolyzed in the GI tract. What does that mean when I say hydrolyzed? There you have the compounds being broke apart, sugars are being cleaved. And what this does is it shifts that sodium balance towards the mucosal side, enhancing water absorption. A lot of the problems in your gut when it comes to diarrhea and for constipation have to do with imbalances, again, in the movement of water across that um, barrier. So in the cases of diarrhea, you have a lot of water coming into the gut and going out of the system. In constipation, you might have the opposite, where you retain more water and not getting enough to make the stool soft to move through. Other um, plants that can be used in the same, in a similar way include, of course, corn and potatoes um, are also useful in this similar context. Now, in addition to um, working on this kind of sodium balance and, and in water retain, retainment, <coughs> Popular somniferum, or opium poppy, also again, and yet another system, plays an important role. So if you recall, one of the side effects of, of the opiates, um, especially in patients following surgery, is that it slows down peristalsis. So this can lead to patients becoming extremely constipated. Well, when used in a medicinal, um, uh, in a, in a medicinal context, and in fact, this is still used, opium um, latex is sometimes used to treat diarrhea in children, and it's quite effective um, because it does slow down the movement of, of the guts. 
<clears throat> However, this is not something that we're going to see on the common market because they are narcotic drugs. Um, we won't see that in the stores typically. Now another plant that I did not put up here, but I believe I've spoken about before is crophelomere. Have we spoken about crophelomere yet? Crophelomere is a, um, a complex of compounds found from um, dragon's blood. Dragon's blood is a tree that's found in the Amazon called Croton Lechlerly. I just forgot to put this into your slides that you should know this. This is called dragon's blood or sangre de drago or sangre de drago. It depends on who's saying it. Um, this plant is in the, I'll give you a clue, it's a family that produces latexes that are often quite poisonous. Think back to my poison island. What family is it? Euphorbiaceae Euphorbia family. Now this plant, when you cut into it, it has a blood red resin exited that comes off the bark. Hence the name blood of the dragon, right? Now in the Amazon, they use this both topically and internally. Topically, they use it to treat insect bites. I've used it myself on many occasions, and it does a great job in preventing, you know, a lot of insect bites from getting very infected. Internally, they use it to treat blood disorders, especially in women, but also for diarrhea. Lo and behold, this was researched um, further in, by a company called Shaman Pharmaceuticals. This was uh, happening in the late 90s. Shaman Pharmaceuticals was developing this and another um, set of drugs. This is the one that made it through. Shaman folded, actually, and became Napo Pharmaceuticals. And just this year, they launched Crophelomere is the drug name. What is the marketed name? It's not Crophelomere. It's fully, fully cause. Hang on. It's got a great ad picture. Let's see. Fully Zach. I always get it mixed up. Fully Zach. This is only the second botanical drug. I love their ad names to be Fully Zach is the trade name for crophelomere. It's the same thing. It's just when drugs make to market, they get a, a new fancy name. I don't know who comes up with these names because they're hard to pronounce. But um, so this is um, the first drug approved through the FDA in the botanical drug pathway to be an internal therapeutic. So this is taken orally specifically for the treatment of HIV AIDS related diarrhea, which is actually a major contributor to um, declining health in HIV patients. So um, that becomes a really big problem. And it works by modifying, again, that imbalance along the gut between sodium um, pumps in the gut, the sodium, and I think it's a, it's a not potassium, it's chloride pumps to keep them um, from, from losing water through the gut. <clears throat> so this is the second drug to make it through that pathway. What was the first one? Somebody remind me? The botanical drug pathway? I'll give you a clue. It's good for drinking or for treating your anogenital warts. Garlic? No. Garlic's not good to drink. Green tea, the green tea epicatechins. Remember Berrigan. Berrigan is a mixture of green tea epicatechins. That an ointment formulation is actually a very good therapeutic for genital warts. That was the first drug to make it through this pathway. So crophelomere is the second. Again, this is something interesting because it's coming from a medicinal plant in the Amazon that's used both topically and internally for blood and other um, with internal hemorrhaging and, and diarrheal problems. Now let's move on to our tannins. You have, again, tannins are these very large, complex, polymeric polyphenols in structure, and <clears throat> they're found in many, many plants. We have tannins in plants here on campus. So, so for example, if you go into the quad and you look at some of the oak trees, those are super rich in tannins. 
Um, some examples of plants that are used um, as antidiarrheals because of their rich tannin content include plants like the greater burnet or Sanguisorba officinalis, found in the rose family. You have um, black catechu, um, uh, found in the Fabaceae or beef, uh, bean family. You have oak bark, and indeed there are many different types of uh, Quercus species that have, um, including Quercus rober here, that have um, uh, barks that are used in medicinal preparations to treat diarrhea, mainly as a tea. You have, again, another rose um, plant, Tormentil or Potentilla erecta, and even Camellia sinensis, or tea. How many of you as a child, when you had diarrhea, did your parents or your, your mother prepare you a glass of weak tea, perhaps with some lemon juice in it to treat that diarrhea? A lot of people, don't, don't be ashamed of your diarrhea, it's okay. What else did you get as a kid? Because generally mothers aren't going to go straight to the pharmacy. What are some of the other home remedies for diarrhea? Nothing? Baked potato, corn, rice, what did they give you? Gatorade, okay, electrolyte balance. I feel like my mom always went to the pharmacy for everything, so I'm pretty cheap. Never. <laughs> the pharmacy. Pepto Bismol. Saltine, so you need some more salts in the gut, okay? Carbohydrates. Water, lots of water. Well, when you have kids, give them weak tea. It works like a charm, especially if you throw a little bit of lemon juice in there, because the lemon also has that astringent effect, right? Because from the, as the acids of lemon. So weak tea with lemon juice is, is not a bad remedy to use for, for diarrhea. Here are some pictures of some of these different plants, quite beautiful. So you have Sanguisorba, again, in the rose family. You have Acacia. Here in the bean family, you can see the pod on the plant. Quercus, your classic oak tree. I was just in this um, uh, natural food store today, and they had some um, Quercus bark, but I think I forgot to buy some. They definitely had it. And then, um, again, another um, herbaceous plant, Potentilla. Okay, so that's for stopping diarrhea. Any questions on diarrhea before we move on to laxatives? Okay, so there are two major groups, as I mentioned, of laxatives that are, um, that are stimulated from, from, from the um, different types of plants. And in fact, when you go to the pharmacy, I didn't buy the little pill bottles because they were too expensive. It was cheaper for me just to buy the plant material. And I think more effective if you can actually see the plant material. But many of the laxatives that are sold in pill form are often the stimulant laxatives. Now, there are many dangers to consider with these, and I'll, I'll go over that in a bit. You also have the bulk-forming laxatives, which are perhaps safer, I think, for more um, regular use if, if, if the um, patient has uh, more long-term gut problems. <clears throat> so you have, um, again, several plantago um, species. You can have the seeds and husks of plantago, the linseed seeds, and also the bran of wheat are very good, and they act, again, as these bulk-forming laxatives. You have other um, laxatives coming from rhamnus and cassia that are stimulant. They stimulate peristalsis. That means that they're stimulating con contraction of the muscles in the gut and can actually elicit a very painful, rapid response. So these are, if you've ever come across pills that say fast-acting, those are your stimulant laxatives. Um, and then you have um, also aloe juice also falls in this category because of the presence of emodin and aloe emodin. Okay. Now, before we go on, and don't peek ahead, because we're going to do a hypothesis-driven test here. Before we go ahead to the explanation of the different types of bulk-forming laxatives, I need my volunteers to come forward. Don't worry, you don't have to eat any of this. We're just going to be pouring things into test tubes. All right. So we're going to do a simple test here. First of all, I want you to pick out which of these are going to be tested for the bulk forming laxative action. Don't look. <laughs> you need to get to pick one, yeah. 
Well, and well, one person doesn't. Sorry, that was a trick. <laughs> so yours is not. If you put that, it's not going to do anything. So put it back down. That's okay. You're going to assist. All right. So each of you, we've got some scissors to open these up. We're going to do a, a vote to see which of these do you think has the greatest type of um, bulk forming action. Maybe we'll do it. We do it. Let's do it in these since I have three of them. I want you to fill them up. Let's fill them up to the three um, milliliter mark. And then I'm going to have you pour into each one. Um, let's say you'll need to pre measure it so we have it very accurate. I'm going to have you, and you can use your scoops here, so three milliliters. Just fill it up to it beats the number three. And then how about if we pour in one, two, three, four. How about four milliliters of water? And you just measure it into here. Here's your water. Okay. So while they're doing this, I want you guys to take a guess. Which of these do you think is going to have the greatest <coughs> bulk forming action? Do you think it will be the Plantago husk, the wheat bran, or the, what is the other one I had? Flaxseed. Flaxseed. I'm sorry, what, what was we have plantago hus, flax seed, and wheat bran. Wheat bran is also what they put in Metamucil, for example. So let's take a vote. Who thinks, how many hands do we have for wheat bran? One, two, three, four, five. Okay, so say five for wheat bran. How many for, and don't put the water in yet, how many for the um, flax seed? One, two, wait, hang on. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen. Okay. How many for the, the psyllium husk? You can't vote twice now. Okay. One, two, three, four, five. So we will see who actually did their homework in red and gets a good grade today. <laughs> 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 Hang on, wait, 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 wait. <laughs> All right. So let, wait, let's see, let's put them into order too. Let's do the wheat bran as the first one, the flax seed, and then the plantago husk. So they're in order so we can observe them. Yeah, four milliliters. Wait, let's put them in order so we know which is which. We got wheat bran. Which one's wheat bran? Wheat bran, okay. Flax seed, and then plantago. All right. Do you guys mind if I take your picture? <laughs> I want to see the experiment. Here we go. <laughs> okay. Oh, my phone's not working. Okay, go ahead and start the experiment. Take a picture. Go ahead. So remember, we had three plus four, so it should be seven. Go ahead and do the others. Be precise. We're scientists here. Be very precise. See what's happening here. Hmm. Are you sure you put four in there? Because it looks like it's less than seven. Oh, that's true. Okay. What's black scene? Now, this isn't a true experiment because it hasn't gone through all the acidic environment of the stomach and everything, but I didn't want to bring out acids <laughs> to the classroom. Water's good enough, though. We got the water rising up a little bit. All right. So what do we see happening? This is the first time I've ever done this, so I don't know if this actually is going to work or not. <laughs> this is, so we got wheat, we got flax, and then um, Pantega. Kind of, so we can like mix them a little bit, like a little tap of. Yeah. Okay. 
Wow, this one really <laughs> absorbed a lot, but it kind of went down. <laughs> okay. All right, let's give it some time. Let's see what happens. <laughs> let's give it some time. It has to sit. It's got to kind of, and we'll check back after we finish. Give it five minutes. Let's see how it does. Okay. It's got to absorb. It's not necessarily rapidly acting. All right. So what we're testing right now is something called the swelling factor. <clears throat> the swelling factor is a measure of the volume of the drug before and after water exposure. So we had our volume of three millimeters before, um, and then we added our four milliliters of water to see what happens um, with this. But because they, I, didn't, I didn't think about the uh, problem that these are not completely compacted, so we actually are below seven on some of these. This one actually looks like it's getting pretty solid that husk is. So if you can imagine in your gut, if you take a, a heaping spoonful of this, you should, or in pill form, you'll see on any pill bottles that have this, that you should drink a lot of water with it, right? Because you don't want to just take something that's very um, dry like this without having lots of water. <clears throat> so we have um, there's a swelling factor of about 9 or greater than 9 for the entire seed and greater than 40 for the seed husk. So I, I was kind of rooting for the potato, but we'll see how it goes. So this is also used in the treatment of irritable bowel syndrome where you might have some inflammation <coughs> along the microvilli in the intestine, um, again, helping to move um, things along. Um, some of the, this is where you can see a picture of the plant. Here, Plantago. Now, Plantago, this is Plantago ovata and Plantago psyllium, in particular, the ones that are used for this particular application. We've already lo looked at other types of Plantago that are used medicinally. Anyone remember? Plantago major, for example. Anyone recall what that one's used for? The topical application for skin infections. And Plantago lanceolata is often used as a hemostatic. Um, to stop bleeding. So the Plantagenaceae are an interesting family for different types of uses. Now in linseed, you can look at the dried seeds of flax. It's in the Linaceae family. Again, another bulk forming laxative. Swelling factor for the entire seeds uh, being about 4 and 4.5 for the powdered drug. If you've ever looked at linseed, when you have the, the whole seeds, you can see how it might take a while for them to get past that husk. And, and really swell very well. You can find linseed again in health food stores very easily. And then wheat bran. Wheat bran is the husk of the grain in the grass family. And um, this is not as useful as a laxative if used, um, if being added to the diet, particular for, in particular for chronic. Um, constipation issues because it does contain phytic acid which can reduce the bioavailability of vitamins. So even though you might look at that big bag of wheat bran and say, oh that's super healthy, it can be uh, used on occasion but it's not something you should necessarily consume in large amounts <coughs> on a daily basis. Okay, let's see how these are working. Any better? This one, the whole volume kind of went up a little bit. This is up to a little under six. This is over six. I, I'm really convinced that the plantago is going to win, so it looks like five people will be passing today. <laughs> so you can buy, again, this in health food stores. Um, the, as far as uh, health risks go, there aren't any notable health risks for the use of bulk forming laxatives. These are not your rapidly acting laxatives though. So they um, are best if consumed again in combination with a nice amount of water. Water in itself is important for proper bowel function um, but can be very useful um, especially for patients that have problems perhaps with hemorrhoids or other problems um, including irritable bowel syndrome. 
um, of the gut. And all that it does, again, is it creates space in, and bulk, just like it says in, in the fecal material. Now let's move on to the sinicides and our stimulant laxatives. These are medicines, botanical medicines, that must be taken with care. The chronic use of the um, of stimulant laxatives can actually lead to blackening of the colon and increases your risk cancer for colon cancer. Now, what's interesting is you don't see that <coughs> warning on your your you know box of organic smooth move, right? <laughs> and it does elicit a, a rapid effect because you are in in the in the creation of the tea extracting the sinicides, which are bioactive drugs. So here's an example of cinepods. Now if you recall from our lecture on the history of medicine, we also talked about important plants of ancient Egypt. Guess what? Cassia was an important plant even back then. Um, now some of the constituents of these, again I mentioned the cinicides, many of your, your stimulant laxatives are actually anthroquinones. If you recall back to the structures of quinone-like compounds, the anthroquinones in particular have strong action on your intestinal mucosa, again, increasing peristalsis of the colon. It also increases water excretion, and that helps to move things along. So you're moving water into the gut, and you're increasing the squeezing power of the gut. Again, the risks are um, long-term use can lead to blackening of the gut, this is really only a concern when you think about patients that can access this over the counter and basically incorporate it into their daily routine. Um, I, I, I'm bothered by this because I feel like there should be warning labels on these types of products. I think that they're safe, again, for limited use, but not in a daily um, kind of um, application. And we're talking about not just the teas, not just the, the seed pods. You can make a tea of that. But there are also dietary supplements where you have the sinicides um, extracted um, that can also lead to these side effects. Yes? Um, I guess, how common are these plants like, in terms of like where they're grown? Like, grown? like where, where they're found? Yeah, where they're found. Like, how prominently are they used in traditional medicine? Or kind of like that. Well, they have a long history of use in traditional medicine, again, going back to ancient Egypt in some cases. Um, and, and they are useful. There are times in everybody's life where you can get a little bit constipated and you need something to help things along. The danger, again, comes in chronic use of these. So many of these species are, in fact, used in traditional medicine and have been in many parts of the world. Now, other side effects of this, as can be expected with other stimulant laxatives, <clears throat> are colic which is um, kind of described as gas pains and kind of griping pains where you have those really strong intestinal cramps that, you know, are, are very painful. That can also occur because of these spasms within the GI tract. <coughs> Another example of a source of stimulant laxatives are aloe vera juice. Again, it cracks me up every time at Whole Foods and see them bottles of laxative at the exit counter. Um, I think most people don't, don't maybe realize what it's being used for. I don't know why they would put that by the, by the checkout counter with the chewing gum and stuff. Have your laxative. <laughs> but these are um, rich, again, in anthroquinones and anthroquinone glycosides. Um, the mechanism of action, toxicity, and side effects are all similar to those already described for Senna, for Cassia Senna. Um, again, this is an example of a plant that has a very long history of use. Um, in multiple contexts, so as you know, the, the leaf gel of aloe is, of course, used in treating different types of burn wounds of the skin, um, uh, but also it's been taken internally for these um, same applications um, for a long time, and there are records of this in De Materia Medica and in Pliny the Elder's Natural History. Now, another um, source of... of, of different um, herbal laxatives you'll find. And again, these are not only restricted to the herbal stores. I want to reiterate, these are found in Walgreens and CVS and other brand name stores, but they're just listed instead of by the plant name. They have some other trade name, but they're all containing these plant compounds. So you have sinicides, 
or these um, um, emodin or cascaricides, they all work along the same mechanism. So here we have cascara sagrada. So if I go into the herbal shop and say, I want some rhamnus frangula, or something, they're probably not going to be able to identify that, but this goes by the common name of cascara sagrada. And you can buy this in bulk in some stores or in pill form. And this is a ground up bark of this plant. And you basically would make a tea out of it. So this again has a very strong purgative effect because of the concentration of anthrins, the anthrin glycosides, and the cascaricides. Again, the mechanism of action, toxicity, and side effects are all similar to Senna because these are stimulant laxatives. Again, the dangers are the same. Um, with chronic long-term use, you can um, end up with um, colon blackening. Yes? What's the common name, if it has one? It's, it's sold usually as Cascara Sagrada. But it's actually, that's not the correct botanic name. I don't know why they sell it like that. It's, it's a ramnus species. Um, now, you can see here on this third picture, we have herbal fiber blend, and I'm not trying to pick on any particular herbal company, but this was interesting because it looks like they're combining um, fibers or perhaps some wheat bran, so you've got bulk forming laxatives along with your stimulant laxatives together. So again, anything that advertises itself as being fast acting Typically, it's going to, if you look at the ingredients, you're going to see cascaricides, sinicides, um, or other anthroquinones. Um, if it is a slow-acting, next-day kind of thing, it might be more likely to be a bulk-forming laxative with um, some of these properties that are shown up front. Here are just some examples of the compounds that are commonly found. You can see, again, you have this base anthrin structure. The anthroquinone structure is also shown here, for example, Emodin is one, and, and aloe emodin is found in aloe. Glucofrangulin found in rhamnus um, uh, uh, frangus, I think. Cascaricides, sinicides, they share these similar structures. Again, with this basic anthrone core, and then just different sugars that are latched on. Sugar, sugar, core, okay? Okay, so that's what we have for laxatives. Everybody's clear on the differences between them, the pros and cons. I mean, now there are, I'm not, I don't want to say that I'm completely against stimulant laxatives because there's definitely a time when they're necessary. The, the problem is, is when they're used chronically. Okay, moving on to gastritis and ulcers. This has to do with upset um, stomachs, um, acid reflux, and these types of problems. So chamomile has long been valued for its application um, in um, calming the stomach, also in general sedative properties of chamomile. It has some anti-inflammatory, spasmolytic properties as well, and antifungal properties. Now I can tell you right now, the stuff they sell you at the stores is nothing at all like real chamomile. When you have real chamomile, I've, I've made real chamomile from flowers I've collected in the wild in Italy, and that tea is like urine yellow and incredibly fragrant. So when you compare that to the chamomile that you, I mean, you're getting like the dried up bits that are, it's just, just so, so you, I want you to recognize that chamomile that's used in the traditional way, that's used the plant parts that are supposed to be used in this, in this therapy are incredibly a lot more potent than you might find in your you know little tea bag of, of bits that are um, oftentimes the waste products. Now some of the important constituents include essential oils, um, terpenoids, again these are your fragrant compounds that give you know, that distinctive um, odor and, and taste and you have also some um, guaiinolides and azulines as well. Now this is generally recognized as safe unless you have an allergy to the daisy family. So if you have an aster allergy, um, avoid chamomile. Another um, um, plant that's good for calming gastric inflammation, especially for patients with peptic ulcer and duodenal ulcers, um, you can um, take uh, teas of licorice. 
In particular, the glycerizic acid is one of the major components shown here, as well as different various flavonoids and coumarins and polysaccharides that yield this calming effect. Um, of interest, though, this is not a plant that should be used by patients that have liver disorders um, that are um, generally not recommended for pregnancy or for patients with hypertension. There are many different traditional teas in, in, in different um, regions of the world, too, that also contain licorice as a main ingredient in different types of beverages. Now, Cynera scolimus, or um, artichoke, is also an um, interesting remedy for um, dyspepsia and heartburn. It's, we know that there are some liver protective um, effects that are similar to another plant that's from the Asteraceae. I mentioned it earlier. Anybody remember what it is? The only known remedy for um, poisonous mushroom, Amantia poisoning, Amanita. Hmm? Not wormwood. It's a relative, it's in the same family as Asteraceae. It even looks a little bit similar. Syllabum marianum. Remember milk thistle? Milk thistle syllabum. Also, a potent liver protectant. It has a complex of compounds known as silibinin. It's actually a mixture of things. And silimarin. Ah, this pen's growing. Silimarin and silibinin. So, like syllabum marianum or the milk thistle, Artichoke also has um, some liver protective um, properties, and there's been studies that have shown um, reduction in fat intolerance, reduction in bloating, flatulence, constipation, abdominal pain, and vomiting um, <coughs> when the leaf extract is used um, therapeutically. So this is rich in the sesquiterpene lactone. Again, Asteraceae as a family in general is home to many of the sesquiterpene lactones, um, a good example are, are, again, these compounds found in artemisia that are used to treat malaria. Also, these, you have many of your antibacterial agents that are sesquiterpene lactones that are found in this family as well. Um, but in this case, it's Cynera picrin, um, and also um, you have Cynerin that are active in this liver protective and kind of cholagogic um, action. Now, another one important for um, treating um, dyspepsia and heartburn is gentian, gentiana lutea. So this is a plant that's found throughout the Alps and also in the Balkans. It's become threatened because of overharvesting and sale into medicinal plant traders. This is a specimen that someone gave me during one of our interviews, and you can confirm that it is yellow gentian if you taste the root just by dabbing your tongue to the tip, it's intensely, intensely bitter. So they make special liqueurs and beverages from this and are drunk. I mean, it's like drinking bile. It's incredibly bitter, but it helps to reduce that painful heartburn. It acts directly. It does this by acting directly on the mucosa of the upper GI. You can pass this around to look at it and see the color. Um, and it also stimulates um, secretion of the saliva and the gastric juices. In addition to treating heartburn, it's also been used to, um, to treat um, people that have poor appetite as an appetite stimulant. Um, you'll find in the Mediterranean that it's quite popular to drink very bitter beverages before a meal to stimulate appetite. Yes, yeah, so for the stimulating secretion of saliva and gastric juices, do the bitter modern terpenoids act as signal transduction molecules? To stimulate that, I'm not exactly sure um, how they interact with the with the with the different um, parts. I wonder if it's in your book chapter though. Possibly, I checked that. Okay, and how do they affect the mucosa? Is it through? So there's some there's some there's some reaction that happens at the the location of the mucosa where they stimulate secretion of these um, different um, juices of saliva and gastric juices. <clears throat> and this is a pretty well-known plant, so I'd assume that the mechanism of action has been worked out. So take a look in the chapter. But I just don't want to say something and not be correct on it. Um, so again, this is um, used 
um, especially in Europe. You have other um, beverages, for example, in Italy, they're called amaros or bitters that might be taken. You have bitter non-alcoholic beverages. You can also have very bitter alcoholic beverages. A good example of this would be Amaro Lucano, which they sell now in the U.S. Um, it is a special blend of very bitter herbs found in Italy, and you take a small shot of it, and the idea is that you do it before a meal, not for the alcohol, but just stimulate your appetite before you start this monstrous, you know, huge feast at the table with, with people. So, and it works. It's, it's quite nice. Helps to prevent heartburn and everything after. Now, other, um, other important sources of, of um, remedies for the GI include these remedies for nausea and vomiting. Anybody here get motion sickness or seasickness? Have you ever had to use the patches on your, on your skin to help prevent that? I have a friend that he gets horribly ill anytime we go into the water. I mean, it's just he's puking his guts out. It's really, really horrible. I feel awful. So he has to take these um, medications, either topical um, um, patches in most cases. So this is um, hyacine is, is a commonly used um, um, drug for this purpose. It comes from Scopalia, Datura, and Hyosimus species. Um, it's effective in treating motion sickness and you can take it either orally or by patch. Now what's interesting again is that this is an isolated compound taken from um, medicinal plants and given it in, in a controlled dose. You should never, never just try and take a beverage or preparation of some sort or extract of these plants because they are also rich in many other um, cytotoxic uh, alkaloids and hallucinogenic compounds. So instead of being seasick, you may really be sick from hallucinating and vomiting all over the place. So be careful <laughs> with that. Use it. It is, it is safe in the controlled preparation. So. Another important um, plant that can be used, uh, again, for nausea and vomiting is ginger. Again, this gingerbraceae family, this is a carminative. It helps to re remove um, gastric kind of gas. It's an anti-emetic to prevent um, the feeling of nausea. Um, spasmolytic, anti-tussive as well. <clears throat> the essential oil ingredients are um, linked to this activity, including zingiberine and beta um, bisabiline and different phenolics. Um, ginger is generally regarded as safe. I have heard of healers have told me in the Amazon also, again, where you have ginger that's been introduced there, that they also will take slices of fresh ginger and kind of hold it um, in front of the teeth like you would tobacco dip and just absorbing it through your oral mucosa can help with um, can help with um, nausea. Now this is just what one healer or two healers told me. It's not been scientifically tested as far as I know, but it's worth a try, I think, if you are suffering from some really bad um, nausea and vomiting. You can also, of course, make teas of um, ginger as well. In all cases, because the bioactive constituents of ginger are often these terpenoids, and essential oil volatile compounds. I do recommend that if you ever do use it as a medicinal that you don't take the dried ginger, the powdered ginger, or pills of ginger because all those compounds will be gone. So you really need the essential oils that are found in the fresh material. And if you compare fresh ginger to dried powdered ginger you might have in your spice rack, you can taste already there's a major difference in, in the different phytochemicals. Another plant that you've probably all used, have you ever used mint when you have an upset stomach or stomach ache, kind of gassy or not feeling well? Mint tea is a long, long-standing um, herbal remedy for um, upset stomach, gas, flatulence, and irritable bowel syndrome. Um, again, it has antispasmodic activity on the GI tract. One of the major constituents is menthol, this terpenoid you can see. Um, you have um, menthone as well as menthoferrin and many, many other compounds. This is generally recognized as safe. Again, I think that you probably get better benefit from the fresh um, mint than you do from the dried, although the dried can be quite helpful. But if you have fresh on hand, I'd recommend making teas of that um, fresh. Caraway, again, is another one used for gas, gas 
flatulence and kind of irritable bowel syndrome. The active agent here is um, our uh, carbone primarily, but this also has limonene in it. Where else do we find limonene? What family is it prevalent in? Terpenes. Uh, Sesquiterpenes. And what plant family is it found in? Rutaceae. Very good. Very good. I always, my, my, my kids remember rutaceae, but it's, ruta means, it's the Italian word for burp. So I'm like, how do you, like, oh, rutaceae. <laughs> so, yes. So you have, um, in the rutaceae family, is um, where you find limonene and, and you know, these uh, citrus. But this is a compound that's considered in some cases a ubiquitous compound. It's found in many plants in smaller doses. So it is found in caraway seed as well. Now, caraway has a long history of use. It's been used to treat um, dyspepsia and kind of gastric reflux and minor GI cramps and flatulence. Um, again, it's something that's generally recognized as safe that can be easily incorporated into the diet as a, um, as a safe kind of um, uh, tea in most cases. Here's another plant. How many of you have had fresh fennel bulb? And I meant to pick some up today and I forgot. One person, two people, a few people, okay. If you've never had fennel, do me a favor. Next time you're at the grocery store, buy some, chop it up, and eat it. Try it. It tastes delicious. It has this taste of crunchy like celery, but it has a sweet taste. It's almost like a licorice. Wonderful, wonderful taste. It's used especially in the Mediterranean, um, either as, a, as cooked as an accompaniment to fish. So they'll make dishes where they chop this up, cook it with other vegetables, and maybe some lemon juice on top with their fish. Or it'll be simply washed, the bulb sliced into little slices, and just snacked on, especially after a meal. It's very sweetening to the breath. So if you have a date and you've had some garlic pasta, start crunching on some uh, fennel at the end of your date because it will sweeten your mouth and get rid of the garlic breath and also help prevent the flatulence. <laughs> so um, the major compound is transanethal and fenchone. This is also um, given to children that have tummy aches, um, again, because it helps reduce the gas. It's also bacteriostatic, meaning it stops bacterial growth. What's great about this is, again, you can find fennel bulbs in your grocery store, in your mainstream grocery store, not even, you know, not need to even go to, like, DeKalb Market. You can find it here at Publix and Kroger. You can also buy fennel teas as well for drinking. But, again, whenever possible, I always recommend going to the fresh source because you're going to have the greatest concentration of those um, active chemicals in the fresh plant material, and it is delicious. So try a new food. I want to have reports back from you all to see how it went. Okay, so in summary, we have many different botanical remedies that are being used to, to regulate GI health. Many of these fall into the domain of medicinal food in traditional health systems, but not all of these are safe, right? So again, like any medicine, chronic long-term use um, can lead in some cases to problems, and especially again with those stimulant laxatives that can lead to um, heightened risk of colon cancer. Now I want to talk a bit about medicinal foods before, since we have time, put the diarrhea out away. Um, I did a lecture this morning on Albania. Yeah. Here are some other examples of that uh, Plantago I mentioned again for, on the, on the left, Plantago lanceolata for um, hemostatic or cut in, cuts, and then Plantago for infections, major fermented foods. Let's see, ha, there we are. The food medicine continuum. So we haven't spoken about this yet, but I wanted to um, make you guys aware of this um, continuum. So in our work um, throughout the Mediterranean over the past um, decade or so, we have observed in the field that people tend to categorize foods and medicines in different ways. So we're always looking at which wild foods are being used, which medicinals are being used. Is there a blurring of the lines? And so I wanted to go through some of these distinctions and think about where some of the plants that we just covered 
would fall. So you have, um, in some cases, you have plants that are considered just food, whereas others are considered just medicine. So, for example, if I have some carrots, I might say that's my food. I'm eating that in a salad, it's just a food. Um, if I have the cinepods, where are they? So, we have cinepods. I have horrible constipation. I'm going to take these as a tea to do what? Am I doing it just for the pleasure of drinking this? No, I don't even know how good it tastes. It's, I'm doing this because I have a medicinal application. So that would be considered as a medicine. So it's still, these are both carrots and center, both useful plants, but they have very different uses. Now let's think about folk functional foods. We've spoken about the distinction in looking at um, plants that are considered good for you. Right? So these are plants that might help shift the balance of oxidative stress um, away from rampant rad free radicals circulating in the body, away from chronic inflammation in the body, and moving it towards a more of an oxidative balance. A functional food would be, for example, a plant that is um, consumed as a food but for general health benefit. I'm not just eating that carrot. And so I'm drinking this tea of um, Rosa Canina, or the dog rose, because I, I think it's going to make me feel better. It's a health beverage. Or if you, in, in Western terms, when you look at antioxidant beverages, why are you drinking that or eating that special yogurt that's full of pomegranate, not just because of the delight purposes, but you're drinking it because it's going to make me feel better. It's a health beverage. That's considered a functional food. A medicinal food. Mm -hmm. So, like, I guess, would foods containing like curcumin be considered functional foods? As an example, I guess. Yes. So, if you and it, it all comes down to your perspective. So, a food and a medicine might be treated very differently in different contexts, right? So, if you're taking a food that has you've added turmeric, not just for the flavoring, but because you perceive it to have some general health benefit, that would be considered a fo folk functional food. Okay, and I use turmeric in that fashion. So I add it to my soups, you know, because it adds some color. It's not really for the flavor. Turmeric doesn't have, you know, this great distinctive flavor. But I add it to improve the health benefit of my food. I'm not adding it to treat a cold or to treat some other specific medical illness. I'm just adding it to have general health benefit, health promoting benefit. Now, medicinal foods is where the lines get very blurry because this it refers to instances in which you are consuming a plant or plant ingredients as a food, in the context of a food, but to fulfill a specific medical need. A good example of this would be the consumption of borage by women following childbirth. So borage is considered a galactagogue. What is that? Think about the breakdown of the term. Galactose refers to what kind of sugar? Milk. Milk. It's milk promoting. So galactagogue is a medicine that women take or a food that they take to promote the production of milk. After you have a baby, you want to be healed, but also be able to produce milk to feed the baby. So there are certain foods in different cultures that women are specifically given only at this time when they're trying to ramp up that milk production or stimulate production of the milk. So in this case, they make a soup of borage and chicken, and this soup is given and prepared, prepared and given to the mother to drink to help bring in the milk as a galactagogue. It's not incorporated into the everyday diet any other time of the year. It's only in a special instance. Okay, so that's a, but it's also meant not just for the medicinal purpose of being a galactagogue, but also to nourish the mother. That is a medicinal food. Okay, so these are how these are broken down. So if you think about some of the examples we went over today, what about cascara bark? Did you guys see the, sagra the cascara bark? I think that one went around as well. So cascara sagrada. If I made a tea of this, would it be a folk functional food, a medicinal food, or just a food food, or a medicine? The medicine is meant to treat a specific problem. It's not really meant to nourish me. It's just to treat that problem. This is a medicine. 
What about psyllium husk? Folk functional. How would you define it as a folk functional? Is it for my general health benefit? Or is it a treating a specific problem? It's still, it's still a medicine because you're specifically, nobody eats this stuff unless you're trying to get rid of constipation. It's not flavorful. It's not nutritious, right? It's just helping move things along. Okay, now let's look at our examples here. I can't remember which order we were in. So this one actually has soaked up. It is like the water level is down, but it has really absorbed a lot of this. Which one was this first one? Was it the, the wheat bran? Interestingly, this one, which is the, was it the flax or linseed? Flaxseed meal. Didn't seem to really absorb. It's kind of, there's a separation between the water level and the, and this one. This one looks like it became almost like a gel. Wow. This is the psyllium. And it went up in water volume. So it like really, wow, it became a gel. 